Good morning again and thanks for coming. My name is indeed Kosti Serebriny. I am from Google Mountain View. And my co-author, Colin, uh, Peter Collinborn, is somewhere here. Uh, today I will be talking uh, about two related topics. One is guided fuzzing and the second one uh, is security hardening. But first, uh, I will remind you about the sanitizers and why you should care about them. As most of you probably know, C++ language offers you a large variety of ways to shoot yourself into the food. Buffer overflows, use after free, integer overflows, memory leaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, many of you care about these bugs for different reasons: stability, reliability, the stability. My focus today uh, is security. So. Quick reminder about the sanitizers. By the way, who, who knows about address sanitizer and friends? Okay, so this, this will be really quick. Address sanitizer is a tool based on LLVM instrumentation that finds bugs uh, related to addressing, <coughs> addressing memory in C++. As a quick example, uh, on this slide we have a global buffer overflow. If you compile this program with a special switch, F sanitize address and run this application. If the bug happens at runtime, uh, the tool will report uh, an error message with all the details you need to understand the bug. Uh, this tool finds a large variety of, of addressability bugs, such as uh, use after freeze and also stack use after returns. The next sanitizer is called TSAN, Thread Sanitizer. It finds concurrency bugs, and concurrency usually means data races. So if you have a data race in, in your program, and uh, if this piece of code is actually executed during, during runtime, uh, TSAN will detect it and report it as a bug. Next one is MSAN, Memory Sanitizer. Uh, it finds bugs related to, to the contents of the memory. Specifically, uh, it will find uh, cases when you use uninitialized memory in a way that affects uh, the program behavior. In this case, you have a stack array which is not fully initialized and you are using garbage bits to change the program behavior. In this situation, just the exit status. Again, you need to compile your program with a special switch, run it, and if the program, uh, problem happens at runtime, the tool will report it with lots of details. Last, last but not least, UBSAN. UB stands for undefined behavior. Uh, finds more or less all other kinds of undefined behavior in C++ programs. As the most obvious example, uh, I have signed integer overflow on this slide. Sanitizers have found lots and lots of bugs. We stopped counting after something like 5,000. These are only those bugs that we know of. But they're not enough. They're not enough because of major two reasons. First, first reason, these tools are only as good as your tests are. And unfortunately, as, as we see in, in most of our projects, Tests are usually not good. They're not good enough to find all the bugs. And the second fundamental problem of the sanitizers is that they're not a proof of correctness in any way. They're best effort tools. If you find a bug, okay, you found a bug. If you fixed it and ran again, the, the report disappeared, you most likely fixed it. But if the tool doesn't report anything anymore, it doesn't prove anything. So, today I'll talk about two other approaches that are complementary to using the sanitizers that will help improve the security of your applications. And the first, the first topic is called fuzzing. How many of you have heard this term before? Good, good. So, this is what the Wikipedia has to tell about fuzzing. Essentially, it, it is a testing technique where you put a bazillion of random test inputs into your application and try to crash it. 
And if you combine this with the sanitizers, you will not just crash it, but you will get a reasonable uh, memory, uh, error message out of the tool. One of the very popular ways to fuzz applications is called generation-based fuzzing. It is when you generate inputs for your application according to some grammar or rule or even just generate random inputs. And this mechanism is extremely efficient in, in, in many cases. One of my favorite fuzzers of this kind is called CSmith. We and many others have used CSmith to fuzz Clang itself. CSmith generates valid C programs that you can then feed into any compiler that compiles C. This tool is amazing. However, this approach as a whole is not always as efficient as, as we would like it to be. Sometimes it just barely scratches the surface of, of the problem. Another approach that is sometimes much more efficient in finding bugs is called mutation-based fuzzing. This is when you take a corpus of tests. For example, if you're, compi if you're fuzzing a C compiler, a corpus of tests would be a set of C applications, uh, C sources. Then you start mutating the elements of the corpus one by one. You can flip bits, you can add uh, bytes, you can remove bytes, etc. And eventually you will find bugs uh, that were not found in the initial corpus, but that are found with the mutations. We have seen that this kind of approach uh, leads to much better results in, in, many, uh, in many target applications. Then there is the next step, which is called control flow guided fuzzing. Control flow guided fuzzing is mutation uh, based fuzzing, uh, with, which, which gets help from uh, coverage instrumentation in the application or some, some other feedback. So the the usual workflow is the same as mutation-based, but you also run your application with the coverage instrumentation enabled. And if any of the new muta mutations shows that it, it has touched a new path in your program, you say, okay, this, this mutation is interesting because it has executed some new code. Let's put it back into the corpus. And on one of the next steps, we will be mutating this mutation. On many occasions, we have seen that this approach uh, adds several orders of magnitude to the speed of bug finding. Uh, sometimes it's just faster. Sometimes it is a difference between finding a bug and not finding a bug. How many of you have heard AFL fuzz? Good. And, uh, hmm? I'll probably not, not be talking much about AFL today. All I want to say is that this is not a toy. AFL is a coverage-guided fuzzer, which is extremely efficient, and it has so many trophies that this slide shows just a tiny portion of those. What I will be talking today is what we call LVM leap fuzzer. But before that, uh, I want to, to, to spend a couple of minutes explaining uh, why it is a part of LVM, in fact. So in LVM, we, we have implemented uh, a set, a, a family of uh, coverage-like instrumentation techniques, instrumentation transformations, uh, that can be used for guided fuzzing. This is, this is not exactly the leap fuzzer. Any other fuzzer can use uh, this coverage instrumentation. So, Clang and LVM has this flag F sanitize coverage, and it has several modes of coverage instrumentation. The first most obvious mode is function basic block or edge coverage, where we, we get the information whether a given function, block, or edge has been ever executed. So this is a single Boolean for an entity in the control flow graph. The second flavor of coverage we have implemented is uh, specifically for indirect calls. So you get 
you get an information when uh, a new pair of color Kali, in indirect color Kali, has been appeared uh, in, in the application. This applies to regular C style indirect functions and to virtual functions. And the last but not least flavor of instrumentation for coverage, we call it 8-bit counters, which is essentially 8-bit counters. Uh, this, this information, th this coverage style is very similar to what AFL uses. Basically for every entity in the control flow graph, uh, you have an imprecise 8-bit counter, which tells you uh, the, the number of executions with some very, uh, very rough granularity. Like it was there once, twice, three times, four times, eight times, etc. cetera. Eight, eight different states. This coverage instrumentation can be used in a traditional way. You run the application, the application stops, it dumps some uh, data on the disk, then you take this, these files on the disk and post-process. This, this is like most of the coverage instrumentations work. But it can also be used inside the process. So while the process is running, at any point of time, you may query uh, an interface asking how many things have been covered so far. The implementation of this coverage instrumentation requires that it is, it is combined with one of the sanitizers. This, this is not a critical requirement. We, we may disentangle these things, but it makes sense because we want, we want everyone to use this coverage with at least one of the sanitizers to get more benefit. And the good part about this, this, uh, this coverage instrumentation that for, for most cases, the slowdown is quite reasonable within 10%. So now back to LeapFuzzer. Uh, LeapFuzzer is a library that implements logic for lightweight in-process control flow guided fuzzing. And I hope it is, it is really easy to use. Uh, all you need is to provide a single function, we call it target function, that takes an array of bytes as a parameter. And you need to do something interesting in that function with your API. So suppose you're testing an API that consumes some data format. You just say, okay, parse my data format from these bytes. Then you need to build your library with two sets of flags. One set of flags if is sanitizer coverage. If you're in doubt, use all of them. But the more flags you use, the, the slower will be uh, the, the execution. Of course, the fuzzer will get more information. And the second set of flags, you, you need to use one, uh, at least one of the sanitizers. If you're in doubt, start with uh, address sanitizer and then try others. And finally, you, you, you need to link with the libfuzzer library. This library is younger than AFL and it is less sophisticated in, in, in algorithms. But it is still quite capable, which I hope to, to prove you just in a moment. It is not targeted at large applications. For example, if you, if you want to, to fuzz a complete web browser or a complete uh, database system, this is not the tool for, for this task. But if you want to fuzz a specific API, a specific library, this might be a very good, uh, good tool. So suppose you've built, you, you've, you've written your target function and you've built the fuzzer. What, what's next? The first step is you actually need to acquire some test corpus. Of a, a corpus of test inputs for your particular API. And sometimes this is easy, like if you're parsing, I don't know, FFmpeg files, PDF files, C files, you just grab them from your disk. In some cases, it is okay to not use any corpus at all if your data format is simple. So you create a directory with tests in it, and then you just run your fuzzer, uh, providing the directory name as, as a single parameter. 
The, the fuzzer has lots of flags. My goal in future is to get rid of all those flags so that the fuzzer finds the uh, optimal flags itself. We're not yet there, but in, in, the, in the simplest case, you run it just without any flags. If the fuzzer discovers new inputs, it will write those new inputs uh, in the same directory. So your, your test corpus will grow as fuzzer runs. If some kind of bug happens, either a crash, null the reference, or a bug that a sanitizer finds, or a timeout, or something else horrible, the process will stop, but it will also write the reproducer on disk so that you can, you can repeat the bug easily. And since the, 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 the test corpus is stored just as files on disk, you can feed this, the same tests into any other fuzzer, including AFL. So this is an example of, of a target function for a font rendering library free type. It's an open source uh, library, and the, the API basically uh, reads the font file, uh, parses it, and, and tries to understand what's inside. So if, if you want to fuzz uh, free type library, all you need is to write this function. This is all your work. The, the, the rest is the work for the fuzzer. And just to, to convince you that this, this technique works, this is uh, half of the bugs that we found in free type uh, during the last months. So as you can see, there are all kinds of things. Buffer overflows, uh, exhaustive memory consumption, infinite loops, signed integer overflows, and all of that stuff. Another example is, on, is OpenSSL. The target function is a little bit more involved. There is some boilerplate code, but the, the essence is all the same. You, you have some API that you want to test. In this case, this is SSL handshake. And all you need is to pass the data and the size of the data into this API. If you know this API, it's five minutes work for you. Now, how many of you remember about Heartbleed? Uh, the Heartbleed bug happened a year, year and a half ago. It, it, was, it was made public a uh, year and a half ago. It was found with fuzzing uh, using some, some effort. Uh, and now I want you to show how much effort you need uh, with this tool. So I'm starting the fuzzer without uh, initial corpus. It doesn't know anything about OpenSSL. It has no clue what, what, what it is testing. All it does, it feeds random data into your API. And you see it found the bug. If we scroll a little bit upwards, so this is a heap buffer overflow. We're reading 50 kilobytes of data. And the second element of the stack, stack trace is called something heartbeat. And this is where the name heartbleed came from. So as you can see, on, on, a, on a laptop, you can find this bug in a few seconds. On a proper desktop, this, this is less than one second. This slide is specific about LVM. We are already using LeapFuzzer to test LVM itself. We have a public build bot that, has, uh, that is running fuzzers for Clang, Clang format, and LVM AS. Also, there are a couple of fuzzers that are not yet on this bot, but will be, hopefully. Uh, one is for libc++ regexp, and one is for LVMMC. And all of these five uh, fuzzers have found bugs already. Some of them found dozens of bugs. And unfortunately, one of the biggest problems with the fuzzers is that they stop being efficient uh, when there are lots of unfixed bugs. So if, if we want these fuzzers to be efficient, we need to fix the existing bugs. And one more thing I want to mention is that uh, with the leap fuzzer, we're, we're trying to help the, the entire open source community uh, to make their code secure. And we're cur currently piloting what we call fuzzing as a service, which is a kind of a build bot, kind of uh, continuous integration system uh, that runs fuzzers for various open source projects 24 by 7. Uh, today we have uh, just four guinea pigs there, two regular expression libraries, and two font parsing libraries. But 
we really hope to extend this, uh, this pilot to many dozens of open source applications. All of these bots have found many bugs by now. I will skip this and we'll, we'll continue with the second part, code hardening. So, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the, the sanitizers are not enough because of the two reasons. First, tests are bad, and second, they are not, not any kind of proof. Fuzzing tries to address the first part. So, by fuzzing, you dramatically improve the quality of your tests. You don't improve it to, to ideal state, but you, you make it good enough. But fuzzers do not address the second fundamental issue, is that the, there is no proof that your application has no bugs. And by code hardening, we, we want to address this, this second problem. I will talk about two kinds of security threats uh, for C++ applications. Threat number one, is, is a situation when a buffer overflow in your program or use of to free in your program may overwrite a function pointer or virtual table pointer with something that bad guys control. And this is not a theoretical, uh, theoretical situation. We have seen many cases of this uh, in the wild. And one of those happened two years ago on Pwn to Own conference where white white hat hackers uh, demonstrated full exploit of the Chromium browser using exactly this kind of threat. Our solution is called Control Flow Integrity, CFI for short. And for simple use cases, all you need is to provide two extra flag, flags to, to the most recent Clang compiler. First flag actually enables uh, the control, uh, control flow integrity instrumentation. And the second is FLTO. So what I'm going to talk now requires link time optimization. In other words, the compiler needs to see the entire program. What we do in control flow integrity instrumentation to protect you from, uh, bad, uh, function, from bad indirect function calls? First, uh, we treat every disjoint class hierarchy as a separate entity. So when, when, we, when we analyze a given class hierarchy, we don't care about others. And this is where we really rely on LTO, because when there is LTO, there are no other classes. We, we see all the class hierarchies and all the classes in every hierarchy. Then we do special layout for the virtual tables. Uh, specifically, we put all the virtual tables for every class hierarchy in a contiguous uh, piece of memory. And finally, we insert some runtime checks. And let me demonstrate the, the runtime checks on, on, a, on a simple example. So suppose you have four classes in class hierarchy, a diamond shape, A is on the top, B and C inherit from A, and then there is D that inherits from B and C. And somewhere in your application, you have a, a pointer to B, and you call a virtual function from B. So based on the C++ standard, at this point, you may call some, something from B and something from D. Right, you cannot call anything from A, you cannot call anything from C, and you cannot call anything from outer space. And this is what we need to check. At compile time, we lay out all the virtual pointer tables for this class hierarchy in a contiguous array. We also make sure that all of the, all of the virtual tables are aligned by the same power of two. In this case, uh, since the maximal size of virtual table is three, so we align them by, by four pointers. So somewhere in the application, in the, in the read-only section of your binary, there is this array. And when we, when we want to call a virtual function from B, we must ensure that the VPTR at this point is either the VPTR of B 
or VPTR of C. Nothing else is legal here. So first, we may, we may get rid of all other, of most of the pointers by a simple range check. So anything outside of this array will be, will be forbidden by a simple range check. And in fact, even this piece, the, the VPTR of A, of a uh, can be eliminated by a range check. Next, uh, a clever attacker could fake the VPTR in a way that the, the pointer is still within the bounds of this array, but it is shifted. So, for example, instead of F, you will call something else. Uh, we also protect from this mm, by an alignment check. So, if the VPTR is not properly aligned, we will not allow it to happen. Finally, as you can see, this contiguous array contains two VPTRs that are good for this, for this situation and one which is not really good. We cannot allow uh, virtual functions from C called, to be called here. And this is where we need a bit set. The bit set shows which classes are good for this call site and which classes are not good for this call site. So we have three runtime checks here. It may sound a little bit expensive, but in fact it is not. So these, these are three, uh, three examples of assembly on x86-64 that are generated by a compiler with CFI enabled. The simple case is uh, when the bit set contains all ones, so you don't need to check the bit set. And this situation is very common, uh, which is when you call a virtual function from a, uh, from a top of class sub-hierarchy without any diamonds. As you can see, no memory accesses here. Range check doesn't require any memory accesses. Second situation is when you do need to, uh, to, to check the uh, bit set, but when the bit set is 64 bits or less. This, is a, this means that the class hierarchy is not really big, it doesn't have more than 64 functions in, in all the hierarchy. And in this case, the, the bit set lookup is present, but it doesn't involve any memory accesses because the bit set itself is encoded in, in an instruction. Finally, if you have huge class hierarchy, you have to, to do bit set lookup. But bit set lookup is a single memory instruction. I've explained to you how, how the C5 works for uh, protecting vi uh, virtual calls in your application, but the same mechanism, absolutely the same mechanism with, with slight additions, works for C style indirect functions for non-virtual functions uh, of the classes with uh, virtual tables, and also for checking for incorrect costs. Right now, our major target uh, with this security mitigation is the Chromium browser, and it builds and runs on Linux and Android. We also have tried to, to make it work on other operating systems, our prototypes kind of work, so they will work next year, I hope. The, the really good news about uh, this whole effort is that we cannot measure the performance impact. We do insert instructions before every, every indirect call, which does translate into code size increase, but the instructions are very cheap. They don't access memory uh, in most cases, so the CPU impact is, is very small. And while deploying uh, this mechanism in Chromium tests, we have found a couple of dozen bugs in the Chrome itself. So as a byproduct of this mitigation technique, it also actually find bug, finds bugs in the application. Uh, in most cases, these were incorrect, uh, invalid costs. This is not the only possible approach to control flow integrity. First, the, the interesting question is whether we can get rid of the requirement for LTO. Not all the applications are LTO friendly. Maybe LTO is not, not a bad thing in general because if you force LTO, you also get other benefits like better optimization, uh, better code size. Visual Studio 2015 has somewhat similar technique called uh, Control flow guard. It is slightly weaker, slightly easier to use. It doesn't require LTO. 
Uh, but just a couple of weeks, uh, there was a blog post which claims that this, uh, this mitigation is bypassed. Finally, a few slides about threat number two. Threat number two is uh, when, when a stack buffer overflow may corrupt your return address on your stack. Uh, and we, we have also seen this in the wild. This is not a theoretical threat. Our solution to this kind of threat is called safe stack. And again, all you need is to pass an extra flag to, to your compilation. What safe stack does is very simple. It places all the local variables that are a potential target of buffer overflows on a separate mmapped region, which is called unsafe stack. And this is all. If, even if a stack buffer overflow happens in runtime, it may corrupt your function pointers, it may corrupt your data. It cannot possibly overwrite your return address. And the, the, the best way to use this technique is to combine it with CFI so that you also protect the, the function pointers. Again, our current major target for this mitigation is Chromium. And again, we don't see any significant CPU usage increase. And to give you a code example, this, this is a function prolog which uh, reads and updates the unsafe stack. It is stored in TLS. And this is function epilogue where it restores the unsafe stack. It sounds a little bit scary because you've added like a dozen instruction to, to the function. But in, in highly optimized uh, binaries, when you use O2, you don't have large function, uh, you don't have small functions. All, all of the functions are usually large. So, and this overhead is per function, not per instruction or not per function call, anything. So the, the real overhead is, is quite tiny. To summarize uh, what I have told you today, so first of all, I hope all of you have tests for your applications. If you don't, you should. But if you just rely on traditional testing, you, you're probably getting a false sense of security and actually false sense of reliability and stability. So the, 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 first, uh, the first line of defense from the bugs would be the sanitizers. And if your tests are sanitizer clean, you are very likely to get reasonable sanity in your code, but not security. If you want next level of security, try fuzzing. And one of the fuzzers is now available as part of LVM, and it is, I believe, user-friendly. Finally, if you are paranoid about security, or if you are actually in, in a security-sensitive area, like user-facing application or web services that consume user input, try something more beyond sanitizers and beyond fuzzing. And LVM today provides at least two uh, strong security mitigation techniques. Uh, one that protects virtual calls and other indirect calls, and one that protects your return addresses. And at this point, I'm done, and I will be happy to, to receive questions. Thank you. Any questions? We have about six minutes. Hello, thank you for our presentation. Uh, do you intend to add protection in your CFI uh, against rope technique? So controlling return uh, addresses and everything? Student, no. To, to, to extend your, your control flow integrity to protect against uh, rope return oriented programming, uh, which is used in exploits. You see what I'm talking about. Can, can someone repeat the question? Uh, uh, yes, protect against ROP chains, return oriented programming chains. Yeah. He's saying, do you have anything to protect against return oriented programming chains? Does safe stack protect against that? Does CFI protect from return to libc? Do you intend to extend it to do, to do that? Do I intend to extend CFI to protect from returns to libc? Well, in fact, it does protect from this case because uh, if it doesn't allow you to call anything that is not there, it should protect from returns from libc. Uh, at least this is what, what, 
what I can understand. Uh, hey, three questions. Uh, first, um, uh, why is SlipFast an LLVM? What can it do that AFL fast can't? Is it just speed or? Why LibFuzzer is in LVM and what can it do inside what AFL cannot? These are two different questions. Uh, it is an LVM because it is closely tied to the LVM coverage instrumentation. So LibFuzzer itself doesn't depend on LVM as a library, but uh, when you link the application with LibFuzzer, it has to be, the, the application has to be instrumented with LVM coverage. There is no other dependency today. Uh, what AFL can do that, they, the, what, what LibFuzzer can do that AFL cannot is speed. Because uh, LibFuzzer is fully in process, fuzzer. Uh, on some targets, it is two or three times, uh, th two, two or three orders of magnitude faster, just because there is no overhead for system calls, for fork exec, etc. Also, LibFuzzer uses slightly different algorithms. And what we have seen with uh, using dozens of different fuzzers, just by using different algorithms that are not necessarily better or worse, they're just different, you get different search heuristics, you get different inputs. If you're really paranoid, you need to do both. You, you need to use both. Okay, uh, for a CFI, if you have base classes that you don't have the source for, for example, MFC on Windows, does that, that uh, class hierarchy just not work at all in CFI, or what, what happens in that case? What if I don't have uh, sources for parts of my class hierarchy? Uh, we have not tested in this environment. I, I think we can do some protection in this case, uh, but we don't have experience. Okay, and finally you said you have the service where you set up fuzzers for Clang and whatnot and you find a, a ton of bugs, right? Uh, say it again, please. You said you found ton of, tons of bugs in Clang with your fuzzer. Um, so I think someone set up an AFL bot long ago and uh, a few people in the Clang community tried to find, to fix all these fast bugs and it turns out there's so many of them and fixing many of them isn't all that useful. Um, so do you have any plans on how to basically ma how to roll that out? Maybe fast lower parts of Clang first and then once those are clean, like maybe only fast the preprocessor first and then Fuzzer and then Simmer or? So do I, do I have a plan to fix all the, all the bugs that Fuzzer find in Clang? Me talking here is part of that plan. Uh, I, I, I really want to, to, to get some, uh, some input, some feedback, and some help, because I personally am not working on, on fixing client bugs today. All right, so two more questions. Uh, so you mentioned using CFI for C indirect pointers. Can you, can you mention, how, how are you figuring out the set of valid uh, functions that, that that's checking for in C? So what, what we do to C style and direct functions uh, in the CFI framework? First of all, there is this whole program mode, which means that we see all the functions, and we say, okay, uh, the, the disjoint classes, in the, the dis disjoint hierarchies in this case, are the functions with the same uh, set of parameters. We can do better, we can probably uh, deploy some static analysis that will say, okay, here we can only uh, get this, this, and that function. We don't do this yet. Today, we just base on the, on the function uh, type. And then the, the rest of the machinery just works out of the box. The, the bits that look up the range. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to put all the functions in the contiguous region, not the tables. And we do it by, by jump tables. Basically, jump table is basically an 8-byte function which jumps to the original function. Uh, but otherwise, it's very similar. So when SafeStack was being added, I remember it being in the context of um, CPS and CPI, not CFI. Did you actually evaluate those, and why did you choose to use CFI instead? Why did we choose uh, CPI, CFI, not CPI? Uh, we were not confident, and we're still not confident, that CPI will provide proper uh, CPU overhead like proper zero CPU overhead. Uh, code pointer integrity and code pointer security, I think. <laughs> Something to that extent. It, it, it is a set of very related techniques, but uh, by evaluating the, the algorithm, not, not the implementation, we, we didn't touch the implementations of CPI, 
We did read the papers, and by just looking at them, we see too much overhead. Uh, we don't believe it can be below 1%. And our implementation of CFI is below 1%. So this, this is a performance question. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's it for his talk. Uh, thank you very much, Kostya. Thank you.